Markov Chains model football with one very specific assumption, and that is that they are memoryless. What this means is that if we have the ball in midfield, for example, and we pass it out to the wing, then this doesn't, the fact it's now on the wing is not affected by the fact it was in midfield before. So this array here is known as the transition matrix. And it tells us the probability that if we're in midfield, that the ball stays in midfield, the next pass, we can think of it in terms of passes, that the next pass stays in midfield, that we pass from the midfield to the box, we pass from the midfield to the wing, or we score a goal directly from midfield. Or we can also lose the ball and it's turned over and the opposition have it. And the memoryless assumption comes in as, as follows, that we've passed from, we might have the ball in midfield, we pass to the wing, and now we may be passed from the wing back to midfield. But the transition matrix is the same as it was before. The ball has gone out from the midfield to the wing, it's come back to the midfield, but there's still the same probability of passing out to the wing. Now, of course, real football is slightly different from this, and this is a model. It's trying to capture some kind of essential process. But there is a degree to which there's a lot of memorylessness in football, that the events from at least maybe one or two minutes ago are pretty much forgotten in what happens in the future. So this gives a very good starting point for modelling football. And also, it is the underlying assumption of the position-based expected threat that we're going to look into. There's one more thing I want to say about this type of representation, because it's a little bit like a kind of computer game or a sort of very naive football manager game from maybe the 1980s or something like that, that the ball bounces around according to this transition matrix. So we start, we start in midfield, we go out to the wing, maybe goes into the box. And each time we make those transitions, they're determined by these probabilities. So the probability of going from the wing to the box is 10%. Probability a pass goes from the wing and stays on the wing is 25%. And you'll see here with the goals, we say, well, the, I mean, this isn't a realistic model of football. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue that. But we say here that the probability of scoring a goal from midfield is 5% while it increases to 15% when we're, we're in the box. And so we just simulate the game. And I'm going to actually run that simulation in a, in a bit. We just simulate the game by following these transition matrices rolling a dice or making a random number and deciding where we've gone. And eventually, the ball is either going to end up in the goal or it's end up being lost and the opposition have the ball. So the Markov chain gives us our underlying model of football. What we're interested in then and what the problem we're going to solve today is a sign of value to each of these particular states. What's the value of having the ball in midfield? What's the value of having the ball on the wing? What's the value of having the ball in the box? And that value is determined by the probability that we can score a goal from each of these, these points. And so what is the probability, given that we have the ball in midfield, that we're going to manage to score a goal? Now, of course, this isn't a real model of football. Um, I've just made these parameters up to, to illustrate the whole idea. But it is going to be the idea we, we continue with when we calculate expected threat based on data. OK, so we've got these different transition probabilities and we're interested in expected threat. And we'll start, we're interested in expected threat for the midfield area. So X, which is going to be our expected threat, X for the midfield area, M for midfield, that's equal to the probability of scoring a goal starting at M. OK, so I'm going to determine this probability step by step. And I'm going to start with goals. If we're in midfield, the probability of scoring a goal directly, well, it's this. 5%. So we write 0 0.05, and then we've scored a goal. And well, if we score a goal directly, we've scored a goal. But we might not score a goal directly. And if we don't score a goal directly, we have to look at the probability of different events happening. And the next thing that might happen is we might pass to the wing. And if we pass to the wing with a probability 0.1. And once we've passed to the wing, the probability of scoring now becomes the probability of scoring from the wing. 
Now we remember this with the memoryless assumption. So it doesn't matter that the ball was in midfield before, and now it's gone off to the wing. Because the system is memoryless, we can now uh, find out the, what will happen on the next step just by looking at the probability of scoring at the wing. So the 0 0.1 is the transition probability to the wing, and then xw is the probability of scoring at w. So xm was probability of, of scoring starting at m. Now we're on the wing, so xw is probability of scoring on the wing. So that's the wing, and we can do exactly the same thing with all the other um, states. So let's I'll make blue goes to B, where there's a 20% chance that we go to B. And once we're there, um, there's an XB chance of scoring. I've already looked at the goal. The last one that can happen is that we stay in midfield. And that's plus point, not point, 25 X. We can also write down similar probabilities for what happens on the wing. So if xw is the probability of scoring starting on the wing, well, the probability of scoring a goal directly in this case is also 0 0.05. Then the probability of staying on the wing is 0 0.25. The probability of moving to the box is 0 0.10. And the probability of moving to midfield is also 0 0.10. And in exactly the same way, we can write down the probability for what happens in the box. What we now have is a set of three equations which tell us the probability of scoring if we start in midfield, the probability of scoring if we start on the wing, and the probability of scoring if we start in the box. But these don't entirely solve the problem because we've both got these xm on the left-hand side and we've got it on the right-hand side. So we've got an inter interdependent a system of equations which describe this probability of scoring starting at m. And it isn't entirely clear, for example, the important one here is that I think it's quite clear that in the box we're more likely to score than when we're in midfield in the wing. But what isn't clear is whether xm is bigger or smaller than xw. Do you have a better chance of scoring when you're in midfield or if you're on the wing? Now, there's various ways of solving this problem. And we're going to do that in the code below. But I'll outline how these work mathematically. This system, these, these equations here, we've written them now out as a, a full set of equations, but we can also write them in matrix form. And we do that essentially by taking the transition matrix, which we already had here. That was the transitions between these things. So every entry in here is a transition matrix and combining it with the goal matrix, which is something like an expected goals model for midfield, the box and the wing. And that gives us a way of expressing this, this whole problem in terms of linear algebra. And I've, I've done that here. I've essentially taken those, these three equations and I've rewritten them in matrix form. So here we have XM, the probability of um, scoring. Let, let me do this. Let me just do those colors again because we had goal, wing, and um, we had wing, box, and midfield. XB was the box, and then the color we had for the wing. Let me let me remember. The color we had for the wing was this purple. XW, and then we can do the same over here. XW and XB. So these these make these equations in matrix form. These equations here in matrix form are exactly the same as these equations here in algebraic form. And the goal probabilities come in here. So we have a matrix which represents the transitions. And we're going to call that matrix A, and we have a vector 
which represents the um, goal probabilities from the different areas, and I'm going to call that G. There are essentially three methods for solving this problem, and we do them all in the Python notebook below. One of them is the linear algebra solution. This is if you if you do a class in linear algebra, you'll learn how to solve these, these equations with Gaussian elimination or some similar method. I'm not going to solve the equations myself. I'm just going to stick them into the Python package and let it solve them. And it's going to give us the G values. We'll look at that in a second. Then the second method we can use, this first method is, well, it gets a solution, but it doesn't kind of get the overall idea. The, the, the second way of, of doing it, the iterative solution, this is exactly the way that the expected threat is calculated when we use the entire pitch. So when we use the method recommended by Kara and Singh, he does precisely this iterative method. And the idea is as follows, that you start on, on the first step, you start that there's probability zero of scoring for midfield before you've done anything. Then you say, let's step forward one thing in time. So here's the time variable, t plus one. So we start with probability zero of, of scoring. Then, well, what can happen? Well, you can score a goal directly, so you add the G. But if you don't score the goal directly, directly, you multiply by the transition matrix, which takes you into a new state over here, and you recalculate. So by repeatedly multiplying by the matrix A and adding the G for the particular state that you're in, you can calculate over time, iteratively, what's the probability that you score a goal. That's the second method we're going to look at. And then the final method we're going to look at is called Monte Carlo simulation. In Monte Carlo simulation, you just do what I really did at the, at the beginning. You make a very random simulation of just popping around, following these transitions backwards and forwards, and then do you end up in the goal or do you end up in the, the lost state? So these are the three methods of solving. We're now going to implement them in Python in the code below. So in this code, I start by setting up the matrix A, which is the transition matrix, the pass matrix. And I also set up a goal vector G, which is the probability of scoring a goal from the, from the three different positions. And I said there's three different methods of doing it. I think I skipped a stage before because I kind of, I started with the, um, I started with these equations here. Um, and I, yeah, I started with these equations here and I immediately moved over to this equation. So all I've done here is I've taken away the A X matrix from the right hand side, uh, from the left hand side and moved it over to here. So I have the identity matrix minus the A matrix X. And now I do the solve the linear algebra problem and it's really just one line of code in this case. And I've got the, I immediately get out the expected threat for these different areas. So what's important here is that the central area, which is the first one here, has an expected threat of 0.15. That's the probability of scoring a goal if you have the ball in the central area compared to the wing, which has a value of 0.12. So when we're evaluating players later, we'll say, well, the value of getting the ball from the wing to the central area is 0 0.03. That's the increase in the probability of scoring. Likewise, the value of getting the ball from the central area to the box, well, it's about 0 0.10 because that's the increase in the probability of scoring. In the iterative method, we go step by step updating the expected threat. As I said earlier, we start with a zero probability of scoring. This is just when we've started the possession, where we haven't done anything yet. And then we multiply by the matrix, which represents a step forward in time. We'll, we'll print out everything as we go along. And so this is on the first iteration. Well, that's the probability of scoring a goal directly, which as we know is 0 0.05 from midfield, 0.15 from in the box, etc. This is the probability that after one pass has taken place and we started in midfield, box and wing respectively, that we score a goal. This is the probability after two passes, after three passes, 
and so on. And you'll see that this starts to converge. So the difference here after nine passes is very little to the difference after 10 passes. And that's because you're unlikely to get a very, very long chain of possession. You'll either lose the ball or there'll be a goal. And so after we've done 10 passes, the probability has converged. And it's this that we read off as being our expected threat. So this last vector here is the, the final expected threat that we get. Now, the last method, and of course we can say, I mean, there's a thing here because like the first method was um, very easy. We just got our answer directly. We solved it with linear algebra. The reason we might not want to do this, I mean, there's a couple of reasons we don't want to do it. One is that we don't kind of get the iterative understanding. So in this in this case, we get the understanding how we start with every pass uh, changes the probability of scoring and then we converge to a stable stable state. But that also computationally, it isn't always easy to solve these very, very large matrices. So if we're going to have a scoring probability over a whole pitch, then it might not be optimal to solve these linear. It might, it might not be optimal to solve these linear algebra problems. But it's also important to know about this final method, and this is the simulation method. So let's just start and do maybe I don't know, let's just start and do two simulations, one starting, two simulations for each starting position, one in midfield, one on the wing, and one in the box. And I'll run this thing. And you can see here from starting out centrally, th these are sort of different simulations of the play. So we start central, pass out to the wing, ball is lost. Start central, goes out to the wing, stays on the wing, stays on the wing, ball goes into the box, goes out to the wing, game ball back into the box, and then it's out of play, no goal. So unfortunately, there's no goal in any of these, it seems. It seems. Let's, let's run it one more time, see if we get a goal. It's a bit more exciting if we get a goal. No, we might have to run it a few times to get a goal. Yeah, there we go at the end. So here, here we started in the box. Um, box, ball stayed in the box and went out to the wing, came back into the box. Remember, this is entirely memoryless. So when it's gone out to the wing, it doesn't matter that it's been in the box before. There's another pass in the box, or there's some real ticky-tacker going on in the box, and goal is scored. And so using this code, we basically simulate, we forward simulate the matches and we calculate over all of those, all of those different starting situations, what's the probability we end up with in a goal. And here we've just got two observations for each time and there was no goals here. So the expected threat is zero and it's also zero for, um, for there. There was no goals here. And then one time out of two, 0.5, Starting in the box, we got goal. So clearly, two simulations isn't enough to know um, the the real expected threat. But if we set it up now, if we set it up for maybe I'll do it for twenty first, and you'll see that there's lots and lots of different plays coming out here. You can have a look at these later. Um, but let me take away the printing thing here. So if I take away describing the uh, possession and I run it for 20,000, then we've run each of them. And now we see the expected threat converges to pretty much the values we got before, 0.15 for central, 0.25 for in the box, and roughly 0.12 for at the wing. So all three methods generate the same expected threat eventually, and but the three methods can be useful in different applications.